The Hedgeless Horseman here again for a third time, uh, May 16th, 2023. Uh, I thought I uh, would discuss a few plays and a few topics. I'm, uh, I'm doing a few articles. I'm always thinking about, uh, you know, theory crafting. What, what's a rational thing to or how you rationally play the junior minors especially exploration plays and all of that because I mean th to me that's the most interesting part of all this and I mean th that's really where the work is in my opinion it's not me watching the gold price or silver price or, or trying to guess what the Fed is gonna do or something like that it's like thinking about okay how how does theory translate to reality? And it's like, there are some stuff that we think is correct. It sounds like it makes sense. But when you think about it, in reality, it doesn't really work that way. I mean, one good example would be that for some reason we believe that, okay, if, if I'm going to have a 10-bagger, I need to get in before a discovery is made uh, because... You know, that's when a 10-bagger starts. But in reality, I mean, there's no company out there that becomes a 10-bagger after the discovery hole. That is just the start of it. And if it's a significant discovery, let's say you have a 10 or $20 million market cap company. They make a discovery hole, meaning they, they hit some good mineralization somewhere. Let's say it's a big target. Let's say that pops... If it starts at 20, it pops to 40 million. I mean, if that actually ends up after a few years worth of drilling, at least a few years, and actually becomes a significant deposit, 40 million could easily go to 400 million. We've seen, you know, you know some of the, you know, really good success stories, whether it's a nickel, nickel... Uh, play like uh, uh, Nova, what are they called, Nova or Chalice or whatever. I mean, they, they got sold for, you know, over a billion dollars. Great Bear, one point whatever. So it's like, that doesn't happen in the first day. But we, for some reason, believe, and I have to stop myself from doing that stuff, because it's always, and uh, which is understandable, you always think that, hey, this 20... I mean, if it becomes a $400 million company or more, if I can get in a $20 million, uh, that would be a 20-bagger. Why wait for the discovery hole and, and you know buy in at $40 million? The problem is that it's much more likely to go to $400 million, many times more likely, after it's gone to $40 million, than before a discovery hole is even made and it sits at 20 million. So it's like our greed makes us take that bet before a single discovery hole is out, let's say, because we're thinking, hey, if they hit, etc. Thinking that, oh, I mean, it's no point getting in after they hit because then it's going to be at 40 million and then I only get, you know, whatever. But before discovery hole is made, there's not even a growth curve. 95% of times a uh, made and drill ha a campaign is, is done. I mean, not for, uh, there are obviously better targets and better teams and better targeting and all of that. But it's like, on average, how many, how many discovery holes or made and drill campaigns actually hit something that later becomes a, a uh, billion dollar takeout or something like that. I mean, you can count that on you know one hand basically over the last few years. But how many are drilling maiden drill campaigns? I mean, there's a bunch of juniors that are doing that. So I mean, wh when when we actually are rational about things, it tells us, which I've written about before, that the risk reward is not favorable to pre-discovery plays. Until it's, you know, kind of a special situation. I mean, Goliath Resources, they had outcropping. That Shorebet zone was outcropping. They could sample that. And they could sample that over like a one kilometer 
strike it you know it wrapped around the mountain etc or, or over the peak that's a bit different because th that was suggested or that suggested hey this is a pretty predictable target good mineralization etc etc and you know the first real campaign went really well and it went up to 1.5 dollars from like i don't know 20 cents or something uh, big success especially early on then of course the latest real campaign they didn't hit bullseyes all over the place so okay we now know that hey we're not l so lucky that it's almost completely unique that everything here is economically mineralized etc but they are raising money now and obviously will be doing work they're even aiming for a made in resources if, if they're you know lucky and can get in the drill meters for 2024 so that's a legit discovery although it's like yeah the shore bet target in a blue sky progression scenario they would have hit in literally every single one of those wide step outs and will we would be sitting at a i don't know you know four or five dollar stock or something now it's down to what 70 or something but hey that happened still you took the bet early on when there's like yeah this looks like a uh, it's probably going to be a discovery you never know that's the thing uh, anyway i'm going to get more into this soon uh first of all i wanted to start off with i got a question on youtube from sondre good day i have a question do you have a video on Xis ready let's say for example lion a special case lion one uh what we would be a strategy and why i have done a few videos i think where i talk about selling and that's a question i get a lot and uh like i said before uh selling is the hardest thing in the world buying i'm very good at buying i am always buying i'm always buying low because well i try to buy low i'm always buying but i have a very easy time buying low because that's when i know uh the the chance of me making a mistake by overpaying for something or paying for a future that's not here or we're paying for some you know uh, an advanced asset is going lower and lower so that's my best protection it increases upside and decreases downside buying to me is easy that's why i cannot afford to not buy uh, in a market like this when prices are extremely cheap because the odds of me making a mistake and overpaying for almost anything that's worth its salt it's ridiculously low and getting lower as price goes lower selling however incre incredibly dis difficult for me uh, and i have never really figured out when to you know sell so okay how, how do you take care of that if you're bad at selling you know you know you don't use t uh, technical analysis analysis etc because that's i mean some would argue that's voodoo as well my simple solution is to that has been to preferably buy and hold juniors where i can see at least a few years worth of growth at least and and it's like you know kind of material growth that typically comes from post discovery place they've already made a discovery and maybe or even a few years into a discovery etc etc because in that case my simple logic there and i've talked about this on excuse me k report a bunch of times that like in great bear great bear had a lot of tops and bottoms over the three years or so it went from I don't know, uh, you know, one dollar to twenty-eight or whatever it was. Uh, so there was one last top in that, but there was a bunch of multi-month and even you know a, a, a year-long top, etc. Uh, late in the innings. Uh, okay, do you need to? know when a top is in or a bottom is in no i i would say not okay what was the again most important thing about bear creek it's that they kept on adding ounces inferred ounces i mean they didn't even have a resource but they kept drilling and they, they kept hitting 
So regardless what we think the value was uh, year one, year two, we knew that they've hit more mineralization and it looks uh, to still be wide open because they you know, found the whatever Dixie zone or something like that. So my best, again, to make it simple is that I want to see that I believe the company could create value over the foreseeable future. Because if I'm right on that, I don't need to be picking any tops. The next top might be higher than the previous top. Then we'll have a correction and then hopefully a higher top, etc., etc. Uh, so I prefer to own companies where I don't feel like I'm paying too much for what is confirmed, but especially not based on what is known. Meaning that, hey, if if there's potential for the uh, this to be a major system or a major deposit, and I'm paying a fraction of that, maybe it gets to 50% of Blue Sky. Still, that ought to be, even if they hit that, that might be, take one to two years to prove up. So then I can hodl for one to two years. If it's even larger than that, maybe it's going to grow for the next five years. So, and of course, that, that's first of all, which kind of takes me away from needing to think about selling too much. But the other aspect is that since I'm all, always fully invested, it means that if I find a case or have a case where price has gone down or something, or value has gone up and price hasn't responded. The only way for me to increase my exposure in, in uh, let's say, a new story, where which has you know superb risk reward, let's say it's you know top three risk reward that I can find if I compare it to my, uh, you know, the holdings I already have, etc. The only real way to get us to get sizable exposure is to sell something. So there, that's not really a problem in that case. If you find something, a story you already own, or you find a new story, and you think that, hey, this is undervalued by 200%, or you think it's going to be 200% undervalued to, uh, today relative to where they might be in a year, then I can simply try to find holdings that I own where I think that I don't think the upside is as high or it's not as probable or something like that so basically it f this kind of all-in approach or fully invested kind of forces me to always be upgrading the quality meaning value shuffling meaning that okay if i buy something new or buy something that i already own and want to increase i need to sell something so then hopefully I'll sell a bit of something, typically not the whole position, but sell, depending on how much exposure I want. It's like when Snowline, for example, uh, when I really dug into Snowline and I made that article, when I, you know, a lengthy article, I have it here. Uh, I thought this was such a good case because it looks so probable that they would have at least like 8-10 million ounces. I plowed in big time. I don't remember exactly what the share price was. I think it was around, I don't know, one, two, perhaps. Uh, do I have a short or something? I don't know if this was actually made then, but yeah, this, okay, this short is from two millions. Like, and I, and I put a, a few. You know, if it becomes something like this, I mean, here we have 24, uh, 24, if it reaches 20. But my main case was like, okay, I think they're at least going to get to, I mean, we have no idea how big this is yet, but still. And of course, it's like I had Little Valley here, for example, uh, which would, you know, possible upside. Grace is obviously, obviously huge potential upside. But the nice risk reward came from the fact that I thought Valley alone given what we knew back then, would be a multi-million ounce, possibly very high-grade deposit. And now I think 
snow line has a market cap of I don't know 460 million or something uh, after they also did a race etc and I think the stock went up to four 450 something like that uh, uh, what was the point the point was well, it, it was a very high conviction play. That's like based on what I'm seeing. And also it's like you kind of know that given how good some of the visuals looked, it's like they're probably going to pull some, you know, to, I think I even, I don't know if that's in this piece, but I did some, you know, crude estimations how, how uh, yeah, here. It's like I, I made a, you know base case it's like you know 370 meters 0 0.81 410 147 250.73 554 1.25 like those were some base case for a few holes i don't remember exactly some uh, were better than i thought some were i think uh a bit worse or at least shorter interval still it's like you know 300 plus gram meter holes so I was just thinking like, hey, when these holes come out and people are like, hey, this could be huge. I mean, my I was still, you know, at this point in time, because we didn't know uh, anything yet. I think we only had these results. I mean, the, the potential here was simply enormous. Uh, so I thought, that, hey, I mean, we're going to know more. But at this price, I don't remember what it was selling at, but it's like, maybe 180 million it's like jesus i mean this could be a already you know a discovery because we had assays we already had it's like we have a inkling that this could be really big uh, and the uh, blue sky is huge it's like blue sky i don't know 40 million ounces or whatever even if it gets gets to eight to t or ten or depending what you know how, how high grade you want it to have maybe it's six million ounces of very high grades Still, that could be worth a lot, given that B2 Gold just put in money, so the, it appears that they're, uh, they uh, agree. Uh, but theoretically, given their huge portfolio, given that Valley is not closed off yet, given that Gracie is still there, given that they have the Jupiter Discovery, etc. I mean, theoretically, Snowland could be growing for years. It's priced at 470 million or 450 million uh could you see upside there could i mean if they can grow for years will this look cheap yes i think so if gold does well do i think uh, they could do well if they have you know eight ten million ounces here etc on the books yes i think so so do i think you need to be I don't know, too worried about calling tops or bottoms, etc. No, if, if one year from now, I think Valley or Snowland will be worth more than it is today. Because, first of all, I think gold is going to go higher. I think sentiment is going to go better. And I think they will have found more stuff. So, theoretically, one could maybe hold this stock for 10 years and at least you know next five years it might have you know considerable growth le le uh, left or or uh, at least uh, where do I have it? here it's like okay th th this doesn't really uh, this wasn't made for snowland but it's like you know you get to a critical threshold for success I mean that's the big spike basically when you have something I mean if it's not worth mining if if snowland found three million ounces whatever then it's like yeah given the location maybe th that's probably not a critical threshold for success because it's remote and all of that but if it crosses that okay then then every additional ounce is gonna matter because if it stops here then one could say technically it's not worth anything because they're not gonna be mining it uh, but if there's a chance they surpass that and there's you know m many years left of growth potential i mean value might be increasing for years to come for snowline but of course the the higher it goes the higher the price goes the higher the mel endowment goes i mean if if that turns in if uh, theoretical scenarios like in three years uh, we, we think let's say they make another discovery and it's up uh, around you know 30 million ounces or whatever 
uh, obviously it's going to be hard to double that than if you started with you know three million ounces and go to six so the marginal uh, uh, yeah decreasing return on investment uh, if one could call it that it's going to be tapering off but it's like in the case of lion i obviously did a piece on them not too long ago i mean this is basically where line one is uh i guess we're pretty close to it now but the market hates gold juniors it hates developers which i talked about in this piece because there's been so many examples of where it's not played out well but you also have a success story in the form of k92 which also has an alkaline gold system uh let's say we are here or something you know if if this was line one who know i mean if you just fast forward the tape first of all the rubber is going to me meet the road soon so in that case either they're gonna make production work or not you know make production work so that's almost like a discovery or not a discovery if everything turns to shit we have a big problem they have debt, etc. I think they are. They have really good mind builders. I think there might be some. Let's say. I mean, no operation is going to be efficient. You know, uh, immediately because obviously miners are people and process, etc. And you know, things need to be uh, processes, etc. Need to be figured out and and uh, streamlined, etc. And and the more experienced the miners get, yada yada yada. Uh, but if we could just, if we assume that, hey, they're going to get into production, they're actually going to get into profitable production, given how large the, the Tuvatu system or the Navilava Caldera looks, that there's a bunch of gold targets, and I think the market cap now is down to, I don't know, 100 and maybe actually 140 million or something, which is obviously not that large. I mean, if... I don't remember what the market caps was back here. I think I actually wrote about that though. Now okay, yes, price uh, share price appreciation, but like K92, even when it re reached 47 and 82,000 ounces of production per year, uh, the valuation was getting up there. It's like I mean, here it reached 2.5 billion on. It was still producing around 100,000 ounces. I mean, that's more than a 10 bagger for line one but of course they were uh, quite a bit more advanced and their ore body is very good they have very high margins we don't even know what margins line one will be uh, but assuming we pass the threshold like yes they can make the shallow parts of Tuvatu, the Tuvatu deposit they can mine that profitably we know the 500 zone is going to be i mean should be wildly profitable even if you have i don't know hundred thousand ounces there or something but it's like you know if it's 20 grams per uh, ton uh, that could be a lot of cash flow maybe it's like more than the uh, i think i did some calculations more than the current market cap and m maybe they find more of that stuff and real deeper and uh, etc so it's like if you listen to sergio for example from line one i mean their goal is to get to what to into production and then proceed to uh, explore and produce and organically grow and show that this is a multi-million ounce gold system I in that case they might be growing the resources and production like k92 for years to come you can see uh, you know the years here is like 2018 M maybe line one is here and we don't obviously need this kind of mind numbing success like a 20 bagger if they can pull off half a uh, uh, K92, so in like, I don't know, five years, it goes up 10 times. I mean, that's a great result. The stock market average is 8 to 9% per year. You're not even going to reach a double in that kind of time. But if you can do 10 times uh, that, uh, the you know, obviously a great return. Do we know that's going to happen? Nope. Uh, when we will know when will we know that uh, in a you know in a um, few a couple to few to several years because not even k92 yes it developed into uh, 20 bagger but that took 
years and maybe it averaged, I don't know, 60% per year or something. My, my point is that I have no idea, I don't know what's going to happen with Lion 1. Uh, but if they get into production, I think that's going to re-rate the stock. And if that happens, right now there is no limit that I can see on the you know endowment, etc. And if they get self-funded and can keep uh, plugging away with their six drill rigs, etc. Maybe they could grow materially from, we don't exactly know what the new resource is going to be, but let's say around 1 million ounces. Maybe it's going to take them three years to prove up 3 million ounces. I don't know. But 3 million ounces of economic gold, high grade let's say, that's going to be worth a lot more than it is today. And maybe if they reach 3 million ounces, maybe by then we look at a presentation and everything is still wide open. Maybe they made another discovery in the Navalava Caldera. So my point is that as long as it's cheap and you see the chance, even probable chance of uh, growth ahead there's no real reason or nothing that would force you to buy like it k92 i mean here here was a top this was like a six month top a pretty hefty correction at least went down and sideways for like four or five months then we had a big flash crash in 2020 and like great bear all of a sudden revalued but then it's like zigzag uh, and obviously huge swings, uh, this is up to 9, this is down to, what, 5.7, so that's like a 30-40% drop, top, drop, top, drop. Uh, if K K92 at, I have checked recently, but let's say that's 1.8 billion dollars. Uh, if it's cheap, maybe there's like probable 50% upside there. And you expect that, yeah, that, that's a gap that's going to be closed. Or maybe it's 100% undervalued because you also think that, hey, they're, they're still also going to grow and expand production or whatever. Uh, I don't know K92 that well. But it's like, that's the trade-offs. Like, okay, how much do I make if things go well, if they keep growing? How much do I lose if things, you know, they don't grow? And, and then balance out the risk reward. Uh, so I don't know if I'm answering this so well, but it's like, unless line one becomes really, uh, let's say expensive or growth tapers off, or it looks like, yeah, they're not gonna be around in three years or there's not gonna be any significant growth that I can see. I mean, then you're, the odds are not really in your favor. And in the meantime, if, if if line one, let's say, gets into production, market cap shoots up to 500 million, let's say, and no other company has really done too well. Let's say sentiment is, you know, pretty bad still. I mean, I would be surprised if line one get to 500 million and sentiment is really bad. But still, maybe at that point, it's like, you believe that, hey, line one at 500 million, uh, that's chump change relative to what they might have or you know what is known about okay they made a discovery there or the 500 zone is like they keep hitting foster wheel grades pretty much 500 might be really cheap we don't know but maybe 500 looks a bit expensive relative to some other play you have which is trading like line one is trading now for example so again, it's like to have a, I, I typically never have a hard sell. I n so far, I don't think I've ever had a line in the sand. It's like, I'm going to hold this until $5 per share, anything like that. Or looked at technical analysis and thought that, hey, this looks like a top. So far, I've never done that. Uh, I, I remember when, when snow line spiked. And that was before we learned that there's some, you know, lower grade stuff in, in the intrusion, that there's, you know, an older intrusion or something that's uh, lower grade. Uh, that we found out later. But I didn't sell in the spike 
up to $4.4 or something. In hindsight, of course, I would have wished I've sold. But I didn't sell on that spike because as far as I knew at that point, this could still be, you know, 20 to 40 million ounces. And then this is going to look cheap. Then now uh, we later found out like, okay, there's some lower grade stuff in there, but there's also expansion potential. So we don't really know the final, uh, you know, tally for uh, the valley deposit. But if if that suddenly spiked for whatever reason, it's like without the new information uh, or with the new information, it's like maybe the risk reward wouldn't be that great. Again, if, if line one just shoots up, it goes to 500 million and you have some other juniors that are trading like joke valuations. And, and line one might be cheap, but it's not a joke valuation. There's some, you know, risk. Uh, they have to deliver on this and that but, uh, for 500 to look cheap in one, two year, years. Um, then I w would be inclined to sell and buy some of the other stuff. So it's like it's a very fluid situation. It's like today, for example, I, I actually bought some line one. Why? Simply because price was down eight, nine percent. No change. I mean, yeah, gold is down a bit, but it's like... I don't think that's going to be the defining factor. And if you can get an 8, 9% discount to an intact story, because we haven't, there was no news today. And yes, it will affect them what the gold price is, obviously. Uh, but who knows? M maybe the gold price will bottom tomorrow. It's like, I don't know. I, I don't try to predict, oh, I think gold price is going to go down now because it's gone down today. So I think that it's going to be a big problem for line one. <laughs> of course, risks are a bit increased with uh, a lower gold price, even though they're not into production yet, uh, because it's, yeah, it's, a, you know, at the time being a lower gold price. But Still, uh, you can't take that to the bank. Maybe gold will pop up. I just know that you know you could buy everything line one has for eight nine percent cheaper than yesterday. That was the simple thing. But with that said, it's like uh, again, rubber is meeting the road here. If it, like a discovery story, it's ki kind kind of binary in a sense. Even though there's a million different scenarios how this actually plays out. If they successfully get into production <laughs> and gold prices, you know, stay around these levels or they're, you know, have high margins, maybe they have an all in sustaining cost of, I don't know, $1,200. I mean, gold has uh, can fall a lot, but if it's a uh, sustaining cost of like uh, $1,900, obviously that's like not a huge margin of safety. We don't know. I have no idea. Uh, but after that hurdle is clear, uh, I think there might be, if that hurdle is clear, I think there might be a pretty big revaluation. Because this, this valuation is a joke compared to a uh, cash flow in gold mine with multi-million ounce potential. Especially since it's an alkaline gold system when we have plenty of, well, we have a few examples of those being really huge. Uh, but it, in short, it's a very fluid situation. Uh, if I find, so find something with better risk reward, and I think that line one is the one that has the worst risk reward that I own, then I um, I would sell line one. But I never have a strict exit plan or strategy. Uh, it all depends. I, I mean, even if you know, it's like, yeah, I think this is going to get possibly bought out some junior it's like you might expect 30 percent upside from there that's if they get acquired but you might have some juniors where you're like hey this is 150 to 200 percent undervalued then also it comes down to how certain are you that i mean if you know for sure it's going to get acquired for a 30 percent premium that's like 30 percent in the bag in that case you could pretty much be all in but we never have that information unless we have insider information that uh, it's like I talked to a guy from Newmont and they're definitely going to buy out whatever. It's like then you could go all in because it's risk free. Uh, that's not going to happen uh, <laughs> that I can see. So uh, that makes it a lot harder. But yeah, it's it's basically just risk reward relative to other risk reward. And uh, again, it's like 
if you had a good run it's like take great bear <laughs> yes if you held it from the discovery it's like a 10 20 bagger etc but after it was let's say it's gone up to like 20 dollars and the per market cap is i don't really know what that would be but let's say 1.1 1. 1, 1. 1.2 billion dollars I mean, it's, it's getting pretty hard to grow that considerably. In in, uh, in the, even in that kind of environment, it was a better sentiment environment. But still, it's like, yeah, if it's the best thing ever, it's like, yeah, maybe you could actually get like a two, three billion dollar sale. But it's you know, it's getting harder and harder to have really appreciable you're not gonna get a five bagger that's you know a long shot even if they have a system that would deliver a five bagger given that it's a, still a load gold system i mean who knows how much drilling that would need to they would need to do to prove that it's like you know two three times as large as it's already it's already mm -hmm. at because it's like they required a lot of drilling just to prove Kind of proved that they had uh, so uh, uh, or enough that Kinross would acquire it. So obviously, the like the growth curve was tapering up, uh, tapering off relative to what it was known and to what the price was. So even though it's not a sell per se, it might be a sell relative to some other place. Because again, it's like I always want to have. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean the best risk reward, the best and pro highest and probable upside all the time. Uh, kind on that subject, well, not entirely on that subject, but I made a post or started doing a uh, post an article called "Quantum Leaping." I mean that's really, and I've talked about this in uh, the Snowline. Why well, I like Snowline so much because like we ended up figuring out that's like it just took a few tens of holes or several i don't know 30 holes for uh, 35 40 maybe to already kind of know that hey the valley is probably you know a big system a multi-million ounce system whereas a negative vein system might take i don't know cisco mining has drilled over 1.1 million meters i think newfound gold has like what 11 or 14 drill rigs or something uh so they need to do a lot of drilling they're brute forcing it i, I mean i kind of like that because it's going to take ages to have one drill rig and prove up a negative system uh, th uh thankfully they have a shallow uh, that's uh, they have shallow discoveries and they're making new discoveries so we kind of know that newfound gold is, given the amount of discoveries that's that could grow given that you need to be drilling quite tightly space that's probably going to grow for years if newfound gold is still around. Uh, which is good because every discovery just keeps on adding the potential upside, obviously. So they, they kind of kickstart new growth curves with every discovery. But still, uh, if I had to choose, I'd rather start off with a market cap of 40 million, have a discovery... Uh, of uh, or potential to have a discovery of a more huge disseminated Fort Knox type system where they could go from zero ounces inferred to three million ounces or more in uh, you know one or two drill campaigns whereas like a negative vein system they might need two three drill seasons to prove up one million ounces I mean, there's been examples, and I, I, I wrote about this in Snowline piece, like Equipa Resources, they got bought out. They had a high sulfidation system that got bought out for, <coughs> excuse me, $1.5 million billion dollars or something after nine holes. There's no nag negative gold system on Earth, which is just going to drill nine holes, and you could infer that they have millions of ounces and worth $1.5 Funny part is that actually, if I remember correctly, that became a mine, a very good mine for Barrick, I think. So obviously it's like less capital needed, much quicker a uh, answers, uh, questions and answers, meaning more drilling and you find out a lot more. Uh, so on that topic, it's like quantum leaping, uh, okay, what would the preferred 
really the typically the preferred uh, uh, expiration story is B. It's 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 really where you get quick payback if they are successful, and you know the blue sky is, sky is huge, and of course that you can find that out quickly, or, or it's just simply really cheap and whatnot. But it's like tectonic, for example. Uh, yeah, you know I have some. Yeah, I'm gonna participate uh, with a bit more in the uh, placement that's ongoing. It's like a four-kilometer system. They might have more targets as well. They already know it's a discovery because they've there's been drilling there, which uh, most holes hit mineralization. So that's all. Yeah, that's all. They already. It's proven that there's something there because they've hit pretty good holes, and it's like four kilometers of runway uh, of potential. Uh, and they are raising six million, I think. So they're probably gonna do a few thousand real meters. I mean, if they're lucky, if we're lucky, uh, they might o prove from just this coming drill season that uh, the flat gold project is a huge system. Might I'm not saying they will, but they might. And if if they do that, given that the current market cap might be around I don't know 30 million Canadian with uh, of course they're gonna burn cash but with like I don't know 7 million in cash that could look very cheap just after this coming drill season that's a quantum leap whereas if this was a load gold system and they raise 6 million dollars uh, to drill they might prove that they have I don't know 50,000 ounces <laughs> you know 70 hundred thousand ounces that's not a quantum leap even though it might be a good system, but it's like, yeah, it's in Alaska, uh, seasonality plays a big part, of course. And the problem with those systems like Newfound Gold is like they are able to drill year round, but they've deployed like 11 to 14 drill rigs to really keep the growth going. Uh, that's not something Tectonic could do anytime soon or most juniors unless they have something absolutely spectacular. Uh, so it just again, it's like in theory, hey, this you know tectonic is an explorer, and you have some other explorer. But when you drill down to it, but you know how do they stack up? What's the what's the blue sky? What's the payback? What's the pace they could pr prove up stuff? Uh, what would it be worth? You know metallurgy, and they tested metallurgy, etc. And it's like, yeah, okay, these guys, you know, you think that, hey, this might have a 3 million ounce target and another story has a 3 million ounce target. Uh, and let's say the value would be kind of similar or, or that there's a load gold story with like, you know, potentially 3 million ounces, but it's hard to know early on. It's easier if you have, you know, a disseminated system and you have a kind of footprint. Uh, but regardless, let's say... Let's say you're thinking, hey, maybe two, three million ounces of high-grade gold. That's going to take years to prove up. But if it's a, it's a disseminated system and the pr footprint suggests, hey, this could be five million ounces. And you might get to l know if it's probably five million ounces within one or two drill seasons. Obviously, there's a shot for a way higher payback. It's a way steeper value creation curve or va value revealment curve uh, on the disseminated system. So even if the end point is the same, that the two, three million ounce load gold system would be worth as much as the five million ounce disseminated system, uh, it might take, yeah, let's say four to five years for the load gold system to prove that and more capital required because more drilling relative to the disseminated system, which might take one to two drill seasons to prove up if it's, you know, has that kind of potential. Huge difference when you think about it. Less dilution, quicker payback, etc., etc. Altamira, uh, primarily Maria Bonita target, which is a uh, copper gold system. Uh, I mean, a copper por uh, gold porphyry system. If they make that, you know, they so far they've drilled and it's open in all directions, open in depth at depth because a lot of the drill holes and they were quite shallow drill holes. And they will, uh, mo uh, a lot of them, I think, ended in mineralizations. Like, we have no idea how big that can be. But if if you give them 20 drill holes and they, you know, punch some deeper drill holes as well, who knows? I mean, 
before this coming season is over, maybe they put in a few deep drill holes. Maybe there's like 300 meters of mineralization. Maybe they step out in every direction. Maybe one or more directions they you know keep proving it up. And then you add uh, that they've hit vertically. And all of a sudden you might think that, hey, there's at least like, I don't know, two, three, four million ounces that, that's probably here at depth. Uh, with what seems to be pretty good metallurgy in, in early tests and it starts at surface and all of that. And I think the market cap is again around 30 million. So I mean, who knows? You know, before this field se or when this field season is over, maybe they'll prove that Maria Bonita is, yeah, multi-million ounce system. And give it that they have already six, seven hundred thousand ounces. You know, I mean, if they have, um, we believe they have two point three million ounces at Maria Bonita at least, then they have a three million ounce district of near surface, probably heap leachable gold. I mean, that's a major mine. Then, then I think three million, uh, thirty million market cap will look cheap. And I mean, if if it really becomes a big one, maybe it's like you know Maria Bonita turns out to be. I don't know, 5 million ounces or more. Maybe that's worth, you know, several hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars. And from 30 million in market cap, you can obviously see the upside. And given that it's not pricing in anywhere near a scenario like that, that means we don't even need to have a high chance of success. If there's a 20% chance that it could be a... Uh, let's see... Uh, 20% chance of it becoming, uh, you know, worth 500 million. I mean, that's 100 million in net present value uh, or risk adjusted value, excluding, you know, dilution really, though. Uh, still, that's, uh, yeah, uh, divided by 30. I mean, that's 3.3. 3. Uh, then it would be undervalued today by 233%. Is that fair? I don't know. I think it's cheap. Uh, but again, you, you don't, I mean, if Tectonic alone uh, hits it out of the park, I mean, who, how many, you know, equally sized stories could that pay for that goes down 50%? Condo resources, I mean, I wrote them up, uh, I don't know, two years ago. Their Pucamayo target, uh, that's uh, similar to the Equipa resources story. Uh, to, what is it, like... Uh, uh, high sulfidation epithermal system. They have a, they have you know samples uh, at surface. They have some outcropping mineralization. The, the, they have a big geophysical blob. I mean, my crude estimation was like, hey, maybe if, if the grades keep up and it's you know homogeneously mineralized, maybe they have like eight to ten million ounces of AU equivalent, and that's something that m we might be able to find out if they ever get to drill that goddamn target because they haven't been able to in the last two years i think it's because of community the community there but if they get to drill that and there's rumors surrounding this that they might it's like i mean if they plug in nine holes like equipa and they have them widely spaced grid drilling because it's like a blanket again it's like they could go from zero to, hey, we think there's at least, let's say, five million ounces here. From zero to five million ounces with like, you know, a nine, ten holes or something. That's a quantum leap, all right. Western Alaska, uh, not a similar story in that, that it's not disseminated, but Bonanza grades already have like 400 meters of strike and they're going to be drilling the last hurrah target which looks i think it's your physics suggests that it's like at least twice as uh, could be twice as large if it is actually continuation of a crd system than what they already hit if they confirm that that is actually the continuation of the crd system i mean that last hurrah trend alone uh, which is, I think, over a kilometer long. I mean, that would probably put them over silver crest in terms of, you know, silver equivalent endowment at kind of similar grades. Silver crest is probably worth, I don't know, th that's actually, I think, an operation today, high, high margin silver, 
producer, but that has a market cap of, I guess, like 1.23 billion. I think Western Alaska has, what, 120 million. So if they prove that and punch in a few more holes, like, yeah, we probably have, you know, a one kilometer trend more of CRD here. And they have, I mean, it's a potentially an intact CRD district, a whole, a whole system. In, so, so that might still just be the tip of the iceberg. But there might, they might do a quantum leap this season. Uh, especially given that uh, it's certainly not pricing in that they have a you know silver crest uh, type of uh, you know mine or deposit yet. Uh, Jaggernaut exploration. I actually participated in the recent pl placement. Uh, I mean, it certainly helped that I get you know full warrants. Uh, they will probably be testing two targets. I think uh, last time I talked to Quinton, I mean, he's quite excited about the, what is it, the Empire target or something. And they also have a kind of a SK Creek type VMS target. I have no idea what the chance of success is. I just know that they have a market cap of 7 million. So it's not price. It's pricing in a 10% chance of them having something worth 70 million. If they would literally make a you know a real discovery, etc., that turns out to something, you know, a significant deposit, which could be a significant mine. Seven million is obviously gonna look ridiculously cheap in hindsight in that case, because yeah, 10 bagger would get it to like 70 million, 20 bagger to 140 million, etc. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, chance of success priced in that either of the two targets that would likely be tested uh, prove to, well, that they make a discovery, let's say, this season. I mean, th that's not a high chance of success priced in. But it might be low. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's 10%. Still, that might be cheap. I mean, if it's 10% of finding something, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean... 300 divided by 10 for uh, I mean this is basic stuff but like yeah 0 0.1 times 300 is 30 million that's certainly more than 7 million uh, we of course don't know what the market is how it's going to react and etc uh, etc et but it's like but still again to remind oneself that yes super cheap well, it looks super cheap, given if, if they actually, I mean, since they appear to have two legitimate uh, targets, 7 million looks really, really cheap, but still, best risk reward is still after discovery. If they make a discovery hole, maybe it goes up 100%, I'm going to be very happy, and the warns will be in the money, but that might still, in that case, be the start of something. And again, if there's like, let's say it's a 90% chance that they won't make a significant discovery hole then there's a 90 percent chance that the stock will not go up i mean it might not go down too much but <laughs> let's say 40 percent chance of well 90 percent chance of going down 40 percent but if they actually make a discovery hole and it jumps to 14 million which is not a lot maybe there's a i don't know 50 percent chance that it will go up 10 times I mean, obviously, much better than, uh, you know, low chance of going up 100% and high chance of going down 40%. But, but it's easy when you look at the market cap, you're like, hey, if they hit with a 7 million market cap, I might be able to go back uh, or, you know, a year or two from now and say that or look at the positions like, yeah, I'm up 20 times. That's the greed, but it's kind of it's in this case it might be rational greed. Still, typically the risk reward is better in a post discovery. Rackla Metals, uh, 11 million market cap, exploring for uh, well reduced intrusion related gold system, snow line type system headed by some Redway. That's not technically a discovery. Well, they have a bunch of targets, but I'm think mostly thinking about their Astro target which looks huge and they had a very good trench result and that's also one of those i'm looking at that 11 million market cap and thinking hey 
what if they have a valley type deposit? What if it's bigger than valley because their intrusion looks so huge? Yeah, but we, as we learn from valley, that's still through a curveball, meaning that the footprint was fat and the holes in the carapace, etc., were really good. I mean, the first pass drill results in like 100 meters or 1.25 grams per ton. Still, there are portions of that that might be sub-economic or at least low grade, like 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I mean, at Fort Knox, they... I think they have a cutoff grade of like 0.10 or 0.1. Still, I mean, it's not that's not barn burner, and certainly in terms of metal endowment, there's a huge huge difference between 0.3 grams per ton for 100 million tons or 50 million tons than if it was like one gram per ton uh, for our 50 to 100 million tons, obviously. Uh, still, I mean, it's hard not to get excited because if they drill the astro target this season and they proved that that's a big intrusion related gold system uh yeah i mean just look at snowline like two seasons in and they are market cap of 470 million but that's the thing if you spread bet some of these i mean some rich way is no fool and the target looks legit and they have a, you know a few targets uh what chance of success is priced in? I mean, almost no chance at all that they will find something close to Valley. Is that fair? I don't know. I think they have a shot at it. Uh, it's certainly not priced in. But even if there's a... F again, it's like... I mean, take four... Uh, let's take 500. I mean, let's say there's a 5% chance of finding something worth 500. That's still 25 million. With a 5% chance. Of course, you know, undi undiluted though. But still, uh, I mean, if it's bigger than Valley, and I think, you know, uh, it has even better infrastructure, etc., so it might fetch an even higher price if it they would have an identical thing to Valley because it's closer to the that road that goes nearby uh, Fireweed. So, but let's just yeah, stick with 500 million. In that case, okay, 25. In, yeah, well, then it's 127% uh, uh, undervalued from a risk-adjusted basis, even if you think the chance of success is 5%. So mathematically, it's a good bet. But still, you wouldn't want to go all in on something that is, yes, on a risk-adjusted basis, it might be 127%, which is not a small amount, of undervaluation but you don't want to go all in at a time like this let's say it is a five percent chance of success so there's a 95 percent chance that it goes down i don't know i mean how how much can it go from 11 million i mean uh, they have more targets but still let's say 40 percent at least you don't want to cut 40 percent out of your portfolio and it's going to if you don't have very little capital, it's going to be very hard to get out at 40% minus. Maybe you exit, you know, with a market sell and get down, you know, minus 60%. So in reality, it might be minus 60%. So a 95% chance of getting slammed by minus 60%, that is not an all-in situation, even though on a risk-adjusted basis, it might be cheap. But again, we need to remind ourselves that... Uh, uh, just because you miss the revaluation, let's say they make, uh, they hit the discovery hole. Maybe it goes up 100%, 150%. Maybe it goes up to 25, 30 million. But those are really good holes and, uh, you know, appears that the system can be huge. I mean, that would still just be the start. Then, then it would be still a 10-bagger to reach Snowline's market cap. So certainly it's not, I mean, I know people hate to chase, but in that case, it might be super rational to chase because now there's a 50% chance of getting a 10-bagger instead of 5% chance of getting a double and 95% chance of minus 60%. But then there's also, it's like, you know, if, if we get some drill hype going, maybe you can sell on that, but you don't know if there's going to be a drill hype going because the sentiment is not really there right now for 
any exploration story. But I think all these are very interesting points. And I mean, I, I could, it's like, I mean, plenty of the, I mean, uh, trigon, uh, trigon metals, for example, I mean, they uh, uh, basically, I mean, ahead of schedule getting into production. So, I mean, if copper prices don't crater or they have, you know, uh, somewhat, uh, acceptable costs i mean that looks super cheap it's like a line one case either it's gonna work or it's not gonna work and of course it doesn't need to work immediately uh, but if it does end up working within a given time frame maybe that's gonna multi-bag in that case because they sure have a lot of exploration potential not only in namibia but they have it in morocco as well so all of a sudden let's say they become a free cash flowing copper producer storing up off at a ridiculous level and then they have a blue sky target in morocco <laughs> plus i don't know years decades worth of copper in namibia who knows how high that could go but i mean the common theme here as i've outlined is like given the valuations out there uh the risk reward on these high risk high reward bets is in my opinion superb because there's such a low chance priced in let's say you did a portfolio high risk high reward portfolio you put in equal amounts in these stores here if one delivers 50 percent of blue sky maybe that will pay for all the other ones And that's why I find it kind of funny. It's like when people lambast everyone. I mean, including myself. It's like, ah, this store didn't turn out well. Or, ah, it's like they didn't make a discovery. Or ah, that, you know. I mean, every company has a correction. It's like Goliath. I mean, that went up, I don't know how many times. And then it retraced 50%. Uh, uh, but I bought that, you know, low, and I'm still up on that despite a 50% retracement. And that story is certainly not over. They're raising money now, and if that turns into a mine, the current market cap is going to look really cheap. So, I mean, that could, I don't know what the market cap is, maybe 70 million. So, five times that, that's 350. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's an okay mine, but it's certainly not a tier 2 mine in a hot sentiment environment in that case it's probably going to go higher and they might obviously make some other discoveries uh, Pacific Ridge not m perhaps not the same thing given that they have a discovery etc but I mean you know with these porphyry targets if they drill deep or whatever hit the mother load or mothership as Quinton likes to say they could certainly quantum leap because that's not pricing in anywhere near having an economic gold copper porphyry at Cleul in British Columbia. Uh, I, I just add some other ones. I mean, uh, Newfound, not really a quantum leap. Uh, Nevada King. I mean, th these ones are making new discoveries, kicking all, all cylinders. SK has gone down a lot in price. Uh, well, first of all, I think there's a few things. Uh, a, because the uh, the carpet bombing campaign at Jeff and TV, as well as the few holes that were dri drilled around Scarlet Ridge, they didn't really come up with bullseyes. So that took a big hit, because, I mean... Dream, ca dream case scenario would be that the TV and Jeff trend that get carpet bombed, uh, they would just have hit it all the way. So it's like, would have gone from, hey, we have TV and Jeff, to it's like, okay, now we already know we have a pretty fat mine because we proved the system is like two, two kilometers long or more. That did not happen, but of course we couldn't have known that. Uh, Odds of hitting immediately at Scarlet Ridge and around that part, well, hard to say what the actual chance of success is. But they got sniffs, but no bullseye yet. And then they did that geophysics uh, thing with, uh, I don't remember the name of, of the, the company. 
Uh, but that suggested that they were drilling the wrong places at TV and Jeff, and that that also highlighted some other uh, targets. So assuming that model, and they based it off of the readings over at SK Creek, and some of the targets that li got lit up in that interpretation of the geophysics or <laughs> uh, some targets quite close to SK Creek. So this could be a very interesting season for SK Creek, uh, SK mining, if they raise some money and only, you know, uh, uh, let's say they do a more limited, because now they don't really yet have, I mean, we need kind of proof of concept of the geophysics, I would say, because they can't afford in this kind of environment to just carpet bomb everything again. And it's tricky to find these VMS systems. Uh, I mean, they find that out all the time up at Skeena and SK Creek. I mean, they're finding numerization that wasn't even known because... Uh, it's not obvious where it is, and they believe they might have an even an offset of uh, or continuation of the SK Creek deposit just a few hundred meters of from the now the northern limits of it. Uh, so, but if that geophysics work proves to be kind of a holy grail or a silver bullet in finding SK Creek creek type deposit we know what Iskay creek was worth so let's say they raise a few million dollars uh go after these geophysics targets i mean hey uh, i mean one discovery hole G given what we know about sk creek if they make a discovery hole or two i think that could kickstart everything again i mean i think the share prices hit what 3.5 dollars or maybe even more but let's say 3.5 i think it's down to point uh, 60 cents now or something uh I'm, i mean imagine they do that they snag a discovery hole they snag snag a vms deposit or or, or two and it's actually like legit grades like yeah there's no mistake and this is a real you know uh discovery hole i don't know you know 20 meters of who knows, six, ten grams per ton equivalent, something like that. I think the whole, the ramp we saw uh, a year or so ago, I, I think that could start all over again. Uh, so this could theoretically be a, be a quantum leap season for SK mining, assuming they raise money and uh, assuming they test the geophysics targets, you know, maybe, a, you know, several of them and then make a discovery or two. Uh, is that priced in? I mean, obviously, uh, an SK Creek type deposit is not priced in, so it's going to be actually very interesting this year. I mean, I know there's a lot of people pissing on the stock now because uh, things uh, the share price has gone down so much, but it's like, yeah, it's pretty uh, that's what happens. I mean, n high sentiment, high sentiment story as well, because like the e hunt for SK Creek. And then it's like, you know, a lot of misses when they carpet bomb, which nobody, no one could have known, of course. Uh, so you have that kind of high sentiment, high expectations going into subpar results, especially relative to the expectations, crashing junior sector. And lately, everybody knows that they must raise money if they are to do any work. So everyone that's like, you know, capable of shorting a stock like that and thinking I'm going to get into the placement anyway, they can just kind of almost risk-free shorting. And few even want to buy juniors in this environment, even few want to buy a, a share, a trend like that, you know, meaning going down. And you have, again, the front running of a placement. And then, yeah, Goliath uh, resources, uh, same thing. Uh, I, I don't know if they can quantum leap, but maybe if they make a discovery or something or tighten up those higher grade zones, I think they could have really good results because last season they did a, like SK Mining, a shotgun approach. But now I think they're going to more focus in on where they have really good hits. They have a better handle of what they think the actual feeder zone is uh, for the shorebed system, which is a bit uh, to the east. 
so I would expect to have some really good real results out of Goliath. Yeah, Trigon Metals I touched about. Magnum Mining is absolutely dirt cheap. Um, Quantum Leap. Hard to say if they make a football is I mean that should already be a lot higher but uh, you know and you know a, a surprise I mean that might be a football discovery with some bonanza grades line one uh, quantum leap if they get into production successfully headwater uh, Midas north for example but otherwise I think they just keep will keep on having aggressive re I mean I love that story inflection this is a p really a potentially quantum leap story uh, assuming they get the deal done with Anglo Gold, uh, I could see multiple drill rigs coming soon, and uh, they might test, who knows, several targets and at least Duck Creek and the depth. If they put in a deep hole into Duck Creek and that's, uh, you know, <laughs> mineralized. Uh, everything's going to change. But also the uh, headwater they have two or three discoveries already and uh, potential kind of quantum leap at Midas North uh, inflection is more in the this thing here I think there's gonna be drill hype given what's at stake because if they given their small market cap and the uh, size of the prices they're hunting uh, I mean a, a copper gold porphyry in New South Wales uh that could be worth a lot i mean we know k day is worth but that that's an entire complex but k -Day's, i mean k day if you found the k day today that's probably 10 mil a billion dollars or something um koval and and north parks they're probably worth a few billions uh, inflation as a market cap of like 21 million uh, they will only get to keep 25 but will be funded uh for all the drilling up to and including a PFS and get a royalty. So it's it's worth certainly worth more than 25 in reality because like if you have a hundred percent ownership of uh if you're hundred percent ownership of a project uh sure you have hundred percent of it but that means if you have to self fund it you're not gonna if you need to drill for three four years and get into a PFS from today to three, four years of raising maybe a hundred million or, or more, probably more depending on what kind of target it is. Uh, let's say 150 million. You're not going to have 100%. Your your shares are not going to have 100% exposure anymore after that kind of dilution. So in reality, 100% ownership, I don't know what it gets diluted back down to, but you've seen projects out there that's like, I mean, gold standard ventures, for example, maybe that's not the best case, but or example, but I mean, that got bought out, but they had to, you know, uh, raise money and dilute and raise money. So he, he, it's called a take under. I mean, that was way that got taken out when it was far away from its previous highs. I mean, obviously, that means also that the store didn't turn out as well as they hope, but it's like, yeah, add some dilution to that as well. Uh, so may who knows maybe like hundred percent ownership ends up being more like seventy five percent after dilution or seventy percent. Uh, so in that case, yeah, it's certainly more than twenty five, but it's not it's not twenty five versus a hundred percent because there's no way you're gonna keep hundred percent without dilution. Irving uh, buried center target. Uh, deep Nanko drilling. Uh, I have high hopes for Yamagano, but that won't be drilled until late this year, I think. But before this year is over, they could certainly have done a quantum leap if the bird center really delivers, or Nanko, or, or Yamagano, etc. Uh, I've looked into Contact Gold, that's an interesting story. Uh, very poor share structure, though. I talked to them recently. Uh, but super cheap. Uh, Two very interesting products in Nevada, uh, which I'm looking into more. Uh, that's about it. I covered a I didn't cover everything. This article isn't even done yet, but I hope you got some pointers. And it's like I, I think it's good to remind myself again. It's you know, there's there's a 
there is a, a difference between greed and rational greed and of course since from a compound perspective downside protection becomes important I'm not talking paper short-term paper losses because that you can never get away from that but I'm t talking like permanent losses and and uh, best two examples in this is like uh, well I don't know it's like jug juggernaut for example that's like yeah uh, given how little is priced in on making a discovery at either of the targets super cheap I mean theoretically 20 bagger potential uh, but still it's like it's very high risk uh, so when you have that kind of you know the, the risk adjusted I, I mean let's put it like this let's say from a risk adjusted basis juggernaut and rakla are 200% undervalued and you have like Altamira and Tectonic and Western Alaska that they're 100% undervalued on a risk-adjusted basis. Then one could say, well, then I should be, you know, all in Rackler Metals and uh, Juggernaut because they are more undervalued on a risk-adjusted basis, absolute basis, but they might still have 90% failure chance or risk you don't want to go 50% of your portfolio into high risk stories where there's like 90% chance of not making a significant discovery at least anytime soon I mean it's like inflection for example I mean if they have if they're gonna drill five to ten targets so what if the first one doesn't uh, work out I mean they have a lot more bullets and they're fun funded for them as well I assuming the Anglo gold goes through so even if you take a 40% bath that's certainly not the end of the story because you have like four or five or ten bullets left uh, but okay juggernaut let's say they have two Rackla at least a one uh, significant target but but their stories won't be o o over anyway because they have more targets but still assume let's assume that Rackla only had Astro and uh, Juggernaut only had two projects, so you have three shots. Uh, whereas some of these other ones, uh, they might be not as undervalued, but they were they're already you know bona fide discoveries pretty much. Uh, we know there's something there, and the same goes for Western Alaska. So there's a much lower chance that Tectonic, Altamira, and Western Alaska are all gonna prove to have something that is sub-economic or not a real mine uh, given what we know right now so in that sense uh, they might not be as cheap but still makes a lot more sense to have a higher uh, position but with that said assuming you could find f f I don't know, 50 juggernauts and reckless metals in that case you could diversify away the downside risk so much uh, yeah let's take 20 let's assume it's like 95 percent uh, failure rate in that case if you had 20 st stories similar stories five percent each uh, ma uh, you know on <laughs> on a pure mathematical basis uh one in 20 should deliver that and if one in 20 delivers uh uh I don't know let's say a 30 bagger or 40 bagger in that case yeah that's actually a positive expected uh, value and that's assuming that all the other 19 goes to zero which typically never happens in the uh, well it's not gonna happen for these companies anytime soon even if they uh, don't make a discovery so the actual risk reward is better uh, than you know theoretically theoretically that they miss because they're not going to go bankrupt the, uh, the day after the maiden drill campaign but it's just an example uh, something to think about because as always investing is a marathon not a sprint and we're aiming for maximum long-term portfolio returns and that includes having big paper losses now and then which are shown yeah 
long rant, a lot of stories uh, that were touched on and I didn't even cover all the stories, but there's just so many no-brainers, uh, in my opinion, from a risk-reward perspective. Uh, yeah, it's like a buffet, it's a smorgasbord, or smorgasbord, as we say in Sweden. Uh, yeah, I have, I have way, way many, in my opinion, obvious buys than I have dry powder. So it's like it's it's very frustrating in a sense that you have stores where you like, hey, I could easily take a ten percent position in this, but you have more than ten, and some might be so good that you have a twenty should have a twenty percent position, then you only have eighty percent left, uh, and you of course don't want to miss the mean reversion in the sector overall, so you can't take too much concentrated, let's say, exploration risk. Because you don't want to end up in a scenario where you don't even have an, any gold <laughs> or silver or copper or whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, again, as always, uh, consider me biased. I own shares of all companies mentioned. Uh, a few of the ones I talked about, or several actually, if you include the whole list, uh, are sponsors as well. So consider me twice biased in that case. Make up your own opinion, for, uh, form your own opinion, make up your own mind. Never invest money you cannot afford to lose. And as always, the higher the risk of permanent loss, the lower the portfolio weighting ought to be. Uh, so, I mean, like some stories here, it's like Juggernaut, I don't know what percentage I have, but m I don't know, maybe 0.4% of my portfolio, 0.5. But if you were, uh, I mean, that's partly because I can't really... Uh, <laughs> I mean, if uh, I, I, my portfolio is a bit too big and I'm not liquid enough anyway. Uh, I, I mean, there's a bunch of companies, um, you know, I'm private placement and I'm stuck. I mean, a holding period, whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's like high risk, high reward stories. Uh, you have to diversify away the risk there. Whereas like Western Alaska is more probable upside. Altamira more probable. Tectonic, I would say, is more probable. Etc. Etc. And then you of course have like Eloro, and you have you know Goliath probable. SK is more a high risk, high reward story. No resources, more of a high risk, high reward story nowadays. Magna uh, is probably one of the lowest risk juniors I own, so I have a very large position. Uh, Timberline. Uh, that's a hybrid, I would say. They have probable upside and they have the CRD trend. Uh, that's hard. That, that's uh, that's a trick one. It's cheap though, so it's like not not much is price. I mean, I, I I don't again. It's like if it's a junior right now, if you know store is at least intact and it's like above average quality. I, I don't think any anyone is a sell. It's just degrees of buys, which is a good thing for a buyer because it's like you can throw darts or or make I don't know multiple different portfolios with like 10 names each and uh, exclusive each and you still would have a pretty good portfolio I means it's, it's yeah it's uh, best time ever in my opinion to be a buyer and a stock picker uh, pacific ridge same thing there uh, uh high risk high reward side but it's like yeah it's not pricing in anywhere near of having a copper poor for discovery Anyway, uh, thanks a lot for listening. Um, you know, if you have questions, ask in the comment section, and I'll try to cover them uh, if I can. But it's uh, some some questions are very hard, like selling. I hope I answered that in some uh, some acceptable way. Uh, don't invest money you cannot afford to lose. And remember, this is not investing advice. Bye bye.